when I got a contract to to do datanomics, I had a different idea going in than where the book ended up. I I, I thought there was something about these these um, kind of metropolitan sophisticated cities like New York or Mm -hmm. Toronto or LA or London or Paris. There was something about these cities that were attracting disproportionate numbers of women because of the jobs available. Mm -hmm. And it turns out I was wrong. Welcome back to Quiet the Clock podcast. We are very excited to have our next guest with us um, to share his knowledge. We have John Berger, who former senior writer at Fortune and Money Magazine and author of Datanomics and Make Your Move. Welcome, John. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, Beth. Thanks for inviting me on. Thank you. Well, as I was saying off camera, we've we've been recording all day and your name has come up a couple of times. So the work you have done is very significant and we're excited to dive in and talk about it today. So I want to spend most of our time on make your second book, Make Your Move, but I think it's important to start share a little bit about datanomics and what prompted you to write that and and your findings from that. And you know, when you you and I spoke previously on the phone, I thought it was very interesting. And I think you shared this with me too, that when you did your book tour for datanomics, um, women were kind of like, yeah, this is great, but now what? And that sort of prompted me make, make your move. But if you could start with sharing a little bit more about, you know, what prompted you to write datanomics and your findings there. Yeah. So, so basically the, the first question I used to get about datanomics was boiled down to basically how the heck did a fortune magazine writer who wrote mostly about, you know, uh, about oil and gas and mutual <laughs> funds. Like, how did I end up writing a book about dating? Yeah. And the the answer is that, um, you know, my wife and I kind of knew all these women who had everything going for them mm-hmm. in their, like, late 20s, 30s, 40s, but couldn't seem to find a decent guy or meet a decent guy. And it was this like ongoing thing where it was like this, this curiosity that kept getting bigger and bigger. And I was just wondering like, what's going on. And initially, uh, you know, when I, when I got a contract to, to do datanomics, I had a different idea going in than where the book ended up. I, I, I thought there was something about these, these, um, kind of metropolitan, sophisticated cities like New York or mm-hmm. Toronto or LA or London or Paris. There was something about these cities that were attracting di- disproportionate numbers of women because of the the jobs available. Mm-hmm. And it turns out I was wrong. That, that this has nothing to do with these particular cities and everything to do with what's going on with higher education in um you know, not just in the U.S., but in Europe and other countries as well. And there's basically one third more women than men graduating Oof. from college. Yeah. And it, and it wouldn't matter if everybody were more open-minded about whom we date and marry, but we are not open-minded about this stuff. So we now have a post-college dating market with significantly more women than men. And that's what kind of, that was the the origin, the focus of datanomics. Yeah, that's so interesting. Uh, Marsha had shared a similar experience, like sort of the hypothesis going into writing her book was one thing. And then when she did the study and the research, finding out something completely different. So it's sort of, it's very interesting to hear that you had a similar experience in that. Um, And certainly the numbers are lopsided and and that's shown in in your research and and your book. Um, But what I found really interesting and I'd love to focus on today is sort of your experience on that book tour and what you shared with me that women were posing this question like, okay, but now what do we do? And sort of born this, the second book. Yeah. So, so the, the big takeaway from datanomics, which came out in 2015 was that the rise of the hookup culture and kind of the, um, uh, like the kind of the coarse way the dating had evolved in the 2010s it had everything to do with these lopsided um, sex ratios in the post-college dating market. And, you know, when I was working on the book, my 
uh, my editor kept pushing me for to offer kind of more solutions, yeah. more advice on, on what women could do to sort of um, answer or, or sort of respond to this problem. But I, I had a very kind of snooty view towards the whole self-help genre. Yeah. And in yeah. my mind, I was writing Moneyball or Freakonomics or something like that. And I was just explaining why the world is the way it is. And given my image of myself as a super serious journalist, um, <laughs> that the last thing I wanted to do was become the love doctor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so, <laughs> so, 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 uh, offering up dating advice was not something I ever really imagined. Um, but as you and I discussed before, like once I got out on book tour, um, yes, women were women who showed up at my events were happy to hear that what they had experienced and what we're feeling, it wasn't just in their heads and it wasn't their fault. Right. But at the same time, they were like, okay, I get it. You've really done a good job explaining to me what's wrong. Now just tell me what to do. And I wasn't really expecting that. And I didn't have a good answer. And that was kind of the origin of my second book, Make Your Move. Yeah, I love what you said too. And I think that's so important, especially, you know, for women in dating where it can be so discouraging and there can be a lot of blame of self or something feeling like something's wrong with you. That's it's like, okay, no, but there's it's not you. There's a real numbers game here that is not in your favor. So I think that's really helpful. But I totally get you having that experience where women are like, okay, great, but we want solutions. Like we still want to meet our partner. We we hear the numbers, but what do we what do we do about this? Um in your book, there is a quote, I think it goes something like, it's a perfect perfect storm of dating right now. And it's a perfect time for women to be assertive and bold. And sort of that's the sentiment of make your move is for women to be more bold. And, you know, I'd love for you to share sort of why, like what you saw in writing this book, why is it important that women be more bold? And you outlined quite a few reasons why, but I'd love to talk about that here. So... Yeah, basically, we have kind of a post-college dating market with one third more women than men. And at the same time, um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the imbalance in sex ratios is not new. I mean, it's been this way for 10, 15, 20 years where mm -hmm. there's been significantly more women than men graduated from college. But there have been sort of other things going on in our dating world. And one of them is kind of the Me Too movement. Yes. And I think we have a world nowadays in which men are rightly, correctly, a little more cautious sure. about saying, and I don't, I'm not like, I'm, I think this is a good thing, not a bad thing. I like it, but I, I think men are more cautious yeah. about making the first move and about being too forward. Um, you know, I, I, I think you know if you look at the dating books that have been most popular over the past twenty years, books like The Rules and all of its kind of followers. Um, the message of those books was basically telling women that the message they want to send to men is not interested means keep trying. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and look, look, I, look, I wasn't dating in 1980 or 1970 or 1950. And, and, and maybe back then that was a really great strategy. I, I don't know, but I don't think, and Beth, you tell me if I'm wrong. Okay. <laughs> I don't think that's a, a super successful strategy right no, now. No, I don't. No, no. And I, I think you had mentioned this in the book too, that sort of the, this advice of play hard to get. I, I think it's outdated. I think it's really outdated, especially given the Me Too movement. And I like how you talked about the book, like just this green light, like women doing something that gives men that invitation that it's okay to pursue or ask out is so important, especially in this world. And I think with anything, we have to sort of evolve with the time. And so a lot of this dating advice is, is so is outdated. And I love the word bold. That's a word I, I use with a lot of my clients. And, and I do encourage them to make their move. I think what is lost on women sometimes, it's at least with the women that I'm working with and are navigating this dating world is that there is this other 
human on the other side of it that has their own insecurities, that has their own frameworks that informs how they show up. And I think very valid for me to, to start to inform men how they respect women or respect women's boundaries or make advances. So I do agree with you. Yeah. I, I think that that advice is, is outdated. So, so, so it sounds like we're on the same page and in that case, we're kind of in a war and, I, and I'm not, you know, I'm, Men don't buy dating books. So like I'm only writing for women. It's not because like I I care about outcomes for men or anything. I'm just I'm, I'm like I'm a realist. Like I'm like the only people who buy self-help books are not I'm it's an exaggeration, but, <laughs> but, but but men in general do not buy self-help books. Well, John, let so, me say, let me sorry, I don't mean to cut you off there, but I, I didn't mention and I should mention I am also extra appreciative to have you here because you are first are your first male guest. So I love the realism and we're dying to have more men on here to give us that realism. Like, I, I love that you said that, like men don't buy dating books. And, you know, I had a session this past week where my clients sort of like, you know, she's someone I use the word bold with a lot is like tripping all over herself about what to text, how to text. I don't want to be too extra. And she stops herself and she's like, do men think about this stuff? And I'm like, I don't think so. I don't. I think they're very literal and they're, I don't, and you can tell me, like, I don't know if they think about it in the same way or overanalyze or overthink about it the same way that we do. So, so I like when I bring this up, it's because I think I, I've had some people think that I'm trying to make, th make dating easier for men. And if I thought men were going to buy uh. my books, maybe I would like to go down that road. <laughs> <laughs> but men do not buy dating books. Men do not buy self-help books. So I'm, I'm in a very selfish way. I'm only writing these books and offering up advice for women. I'm trying to sort of offer up advice about what's going, what outcomes are going to be best for women. Um, I, I don't really care about the men in a selfish way, just because they don't—they're not going to buy my book. Yeah. So well, thank you the, for the, writing it for all the ladies. The, that's, <laughs> the, that's my framework, and it, that probably sounds crass or overly simplistic, but th th that th that's where I'm coming from. But so if if men are cautious about making the first move, and and I think rightfully so because. Um, uh, I, I don't think that like, you, you know, a guy meets a woman at a party, she seems disinterested. The message she does not want him to take away from this is keep trying. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so I, I think, I think guys are kind of learning their lessons here in a good way. I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not, I, like I, I'm not drawing any, ill conclusions from this. I think, I think this is, this is progress. Sure. Yeah. That, 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 that guys are kind of reining in their behavior a little bit, but the end result of this is it gives this massive built in advantage to women who are willing to make the first move. Um, women who are willing to go after the guy while other women are waiting for him to notice her. Well, and you did, you had, you know, and we'll talk more about like the advice side of this that you offer in the book, but you had many examples in the book where women were super successful um, when they were bold. And, and I think that's one of the reasons to be more bold is, and you share this in the book that men miss those cues, men miss those subtle cues of, of interest. And it's, you know, important to be more bold and more direct. And there were, there were stories you offered in the book too, where men were like, mm -hmm. I totally missed that. I had no idea that she was expressing interest. Yeah. I, although, yes, exactly. But I would, I would broaden it. I would say human beings miss those cues. It's not just men. men fair, such very as women. fair, very fair. Yes. Human beings suck at noticing when they're being flirted with. And that's what the research shows. So again, I'm writing for women. So if you think your hair flip or your shoe dangle is <laughs> noticeable compared to the guy that you're interested in, he, he, he thinks your your foot itches or something. He, he no right, idea. you're so literal. That, like that's the thing. It's like my clients. Going on. Yeah, my clients will write these texts, and I'm like, he's not gonna get that. Like you think you're being so clear, and you know this is something I want to talk about too. Is 
reasons why women are not being bold. And it's all these narratives that they have that they'll be too much or they'll be too extra or they're sc- they'll scare a guy away. And they literally are like, we o- overthink how to say it, what to say it, if we should say it. And then we put together these really sort of confusing, unclear messages. And we're like, okay, he should know. He should know I like him. And, and it's not clear at all. And again, I don't think it's a gender thing. You know, the if if flirting were clear, there would be like like the whole point of flirting is doing something in a way that's not going to be embarrassing to you if you get caught, essentially, right? I mean, like so 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 the idea is that that you're going to signal in a way that's unclear. Yes, and and, and that's the end result. It's unclear. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and again, going back to why women should be more bold is, you know, you say in the book too, is men like women that like them, right? So if it's unclear that they, or or, or both ways, I guess, you know, I'm speaking from the lens of of women and our audience who are women who are frustrated by dating. But um, I think that's an important statistic to know for women to encourage them to be more bold that men actually, I think it was a match.com survey you talked about in your book, there was like 95% of men prefer that women ask them out or for their number or first kiss. And, you know, I think that's yeah. an encouraging yeah. percentage. Yeah. Although like, I mean, I, I could probably expand it and say that human beings like other human beings who like them. Sure. You know, I, mean, I think that is generally true. However, whenever I use that line on the, on the lecture circuit, men like women, you like them. Basically there's like men nodding in unison women looking at me like I'm crazy (laughs) because, because the the, uh, women have been socialized, you know, to think that the way you get a guy to like you is by playing hard to get, or they've read books like the rules or why men love bitches or all all, all, this whole Mm. genre of Mm -hmm. books and dating guides that make it seem as if the only way you can get a guy to, to like you is if you pretend not to like him. Mm. And I'm, you know, but again, maybe that worked 30 years ago. I, I don't know, but I don't think that's going to work now. Yeah, I'm with you. And, and I think that women still sort of date from that framework that the men make the move or the men initiate. I, again, I have so many female clients, right? We're talking, you know, humans, but, you know, my clients that I work with that are female and dating, that they're waiting for the guy to make the move and then everything kind of falls flat. And, you know, if they're corresponding back and forth on the app and then the guy's not asking them out, I'll say, well, you know, what about you asking them out? And they look at me like I'm crazy. So, um, like right after the book came out, I I have a friend who's a English professor, um, at Rollins college in Florida. And she, in addition to her regular duties as an English professor, she she teaches kind of a um, a life skills kind of class for mm-hmm. graduating seniors. And basically, a, a everything from um, you know career stuff to um, finance to you know relationships. And you know she had read my book and um, she had me talk about make your move. And uh, and I'm sure we'll get to this soon, but I, I have lots of doubts about or lots of questions or skepticism about online dating. But anyway, th- so um, uh, the there were you know these forty kids in the class. This was kind of a Zoom thing. It was still kind of not not quite the end of COVID, but it was still the COVID era. And they, they heard me express my doubts about online dating, and one woman in the class asked me, well, okay, how am I supposed to meet somebody if not um, through a dating app? Mm. And so I said, okay, well, let's just, we're, we're going to turn our Zoom screen to the Brady Bunch mode where I can see everybody. And I'm going to ask a question. And the question was, how many of you know somebody who's single whom, you, whom you've ever wondered about dating? Mm. And I realize you ask a bunch of 21 year olds in college, the answer is going to be different yeah. than if you ask 40 year olds. However, I've at, but anyway, in this case, 
there were 40 kids in the class, every hand went up. Mm. And I've asked, I've asked this question a lot in lots of speaking event, events. And yes, the numbers are going to be higher with 21 year olds than 41 year olds, but it's still a majority, mm. you know, with, with older singles. So my feeling, you know, maybe this is relevant to your clients. Like, I suspect your clients already know somebody who they'd like to date. Right? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, there's just so much fear around it, the fear of rejection, fear of being vulnerable. It's, you know, it's this protective mechanism that people are using that are really, it's just getting in the way of being bold or making your move or being more clear. I, 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 like if like, we're not shopping for a used car here, we're looking for like a life partner. Yeah. So if the people who show up at my events are your clients or your, your, your patients, you know, have already identified somebody who they think they might be right for, like how silly is it for them not to act on that? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I agree. It's certainly the advice I'm trying to encourage my clients to do. And I, I also try to be really mindful as someone now in a relationship that it's sort of easier said than done. But I think, you know, there's a whole sop- separate conversation as to why people are not doing that. But I, yeah, I agree. I think that people could be a lot more successful if they sort of moved through the fears or, you know, felt afraid and did it anyway. I think a lot of people, and you and I talked about this on our phone call, like the, the way people communicate now is is lacking big time, you know, social skills, I, communication I, squ- skills. Yeah, okay. are, are, you, are your patients like... Twenties and thirties—is that mostly who you? Thirties and thirties and forties. I mean, at least with the younger crowd, and you, you tell me if you've seen this or experienced this. There's like an otherworldly fear of awkwardness, of of doing anything inappropriate. Yeah, and yeah. I think this really gets in the way when it comes to dating. Uh, yeah, I, I think that, well, I th- also think there's a sentiment of like wanting to belong and wanting to be liked and like twisting yourself into this version that you think is acceptable or you think that someone would like. And I think that gets in the way of showing who you really are. But yeah, I think there's so much fear wrapped up in this. I And I think that's why this is a great book. And it's the same advice I give my clients is there are, there are real reasons. That's why I love your book too. It's like you have facts and data that shows and supports that you know, this could work, that Ben actually want the green light, that Ben actually appreciate some initiation, I think traditionally, and still it's, it's, you know, I'll give some men props. It's like a lot of pressure on men to make the move and be the one that takes the lead there. Well, look, look, again, this is where I was coming from before. Like, I'm not focused on the pressure on men and like making things easier. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about this from the perspective of how does the woman get the guy she wants? Mm, I love that. Yeah. And there's all this research showing that at least, you know, if you make an effort with your first choice guy, you're much more likely to end up with him than if you wait for him to notice that he like that you like him. Yeah. Yeah. Because as we've talked about guys don't guys, guys can be oblivious. So if, if, you, if you've already identified a guy who you think might be right for you, um, you, you should go for it. Because if you're waiting for him to notice, mm. yeah, no, I, th- 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 that's not a, you know, it's not a good choice. Yeah. Well, I think this is a good place to wrap up here and then jump into the next episode where I want you to share some of the advice that you have offered in the book. Um, but certainly many, many good reasons for women to be bold. And thank you for your, your insights, your honesty, your male perspective on this. And, um, let's wrap up here and then jump into the advice that you offer in your book. If you're ready to take charge of your relationship journey, visit quietetheclock.com today to download your free copy of Balancing the Biological Clock, expert advice on handling an unready partner. This is a guide I created for those navigating the complex terrain of differing timelines with your partner. It will provide you with exclusive insights on understanding your relationship by sparking meaningful conversations and encouraging you to take unconventional action in the face of life's most important decisions. Again, head over to quietetheclock.com now and claim your free copy of Balancing the Biological Clock, expert advice on handling an unready partner.